The lady, like, yelled at me. She didn't actually yell at me. She just spoke in a stern voice, and she interrupted me and called me ma'am. Hello, and welcome back to the Hard Feelings Podcast. This is, of course, my mental health podcast, where we talk about things like anxiety, depression, anger, resentment, jealousy, aka hard feelings. Thanks for Thanks for, I don't know, I was gonna say thanks for letting me take a week off last week, as if I, as if I need your permission, as if I asked. Um, I did post a video last week, but I did a journal with me, so for those of you who only listen to the podcast, be sure to head over to my YouTube channel. I've been wanting to do that for a long time, because I just freaking love journaling so much, and I also have ADHD and love doing parallel play. What is it? I found out what people actually call it, generally. Was it mirroring that was the term I meant to use? Whatever. Parallel play, mirroring, you know, doing an activity at the same time as somebody else in order to make you feel like you can do it. If if you know, you know. And I had a lot of fun doing that. I had some great breakthroughs in that journaling session too. I wrote like five pages and I had a lot, a lot of big zingers in there. But anyways, today's episode, today we're going to talk about my least favorite topic probably ever, which is rejection. RSD or rejection sensitivity dysphoria is something that is commonly associated with ADHD, but anybody can have it. So I do, I want to give the definition first in case you haven't heard of it before, because the day I learned this term, I was like, oh, that's what that is. And I love being being able to put a name to something that I struggle with because then I feel like I can find coping mechanisms. So rejection sensitivity dysphoria is when you experience severe emotional pain because of a failure or feeling rejected. It's linked to ADHD and experts suspect it happens due to differences in brain structure. Those differences mean your brain can't regulate rejection related emotions and behaviors making them much more intense. So <laughs> basically if you're somebody like me who after any sort of confrontation just feels like you're gonna cry immediately even though it was no big deal. I don't know, maybe you worked in a coffee shop and a lady came in and asked you to turn the volume down on the music and you told her that you weren't allowed to touch the volume on the music and then she yelled at you and told you you were stupid and you had to try not to cry for like the next four hours of your shift. I don't know, maybe that's, has that ever happened to you guys? But yeah, <laughs> I am sensitive to rejection. Man, oh man, am I sensitive to rejection. I struggled with it yesterday. That's the reason we're talking about it today because yesterday I was putting in an order for a new prescription and I was a little confused about like how to put the insurance in and like when at that point in the process to do it so they had a helpline and I called the helpline and then the lady like yelled at me she didn't actually yell at me she just spoke in a stern voice and she interrupted me and called me ma'am but she told me you should never order a prescription without calling the insurance company first and just like that one thing alone like that one stern bit of tone that rejection of me you know even though it's not an actual rejection like there's really nothing she can reject me for but her just like her telling me I did something wrong hurt me so deeply that I was just like okay thank you so much have a great day you've been so helpful and hung up the phone like I just like after that was just so discouraged by that. RSD and being a highly sensitive person are kind of what made me look more into neurodivergence and like people whose brains just work a little differently because those two things are just very prevalent in my life and kind of always have been and almost feel like they've, I don't want to say gotten worse over time. I don't know. I definitely think there's a time where I was a kid where I was just like having so much fun that I didn't care. Whereas as an adult, I, you know, Know, you start to care about other people's opinions a little more maybe. I don't know, it's different because like in middle school I cared so much about people's opinions and like even on the playground in elementary school I did but it was just different. Now it's just different. When I was a kid I was afraid of all authority figures. Like if a teacher wasn't super super overtly friendly and like motherly <laughs> Then I was like, oh, I'm so scared. Like, <laughs> I really did not do well with strict teachers. And I didn't really end up ever getting the strict teachers. I think my mom really advocated for me to not get the strict teachers because she knew I was just gonna not have as good of a time with them. And I was talking to my therapist about this and she said, you know, it all stems from a survival instinct. Your body is reacting as if your survival depends on being accepted by everybody around you. Because way back in the day, I say back in the day, like it was like 50 years ago, back in like caveman times, 
dude. People had to be accepted by the tribe in order to survive because they were still, they like just learned how to start a fire. You know, one guy knew how to start a fire, so obviously everybody's gonna go hang out with him and then somebody else invented the wheel and then they bring him into the tribe and everybody contributes their own thing. So if you're removed from the tribe, then you're losing all your resources. But IRL today in 2024, that is not something I have to worry about. And yet when the lady on the customer service line interrupts me, I feel like my body is gonna shut down. I feel so hurt. I feel my heart start beating faster. Like the anxiety just gets turned up so quickly. And I, I feel like I'm a kid getting in trouble. The feeling of rejection makes you feel so, so small. And I hate to feel small. Who doesn't want more self-confidence in their lives? I know I do. And rejection just makes me feel really small. And it's something I want to work on. I think that's kind of the misconception about like labeling why you behave the way you behave. I, I know there's like this thought of some people being like, oh, everybody wants to put a label on it nowadays. Everybody's neurodivergent nowadays. Like, oh, RSD, that's just another new thing. But for me, it just makes me feel less insane, you know? <laughs> like, isn't it kind of great to know that there's this thing that other people struggle with too? I don't know, like it doesn't make me feel like, oh, whew, I have an excuse now and now that'll never bother me again. Like, I, it still bothers me. It still stresses me out, but at least now I can learn coping mechanisms from other people who have been doing it a lot longer than I have. I read this book, well, I listened to the audiobook of this book called The Tools by Phil Stutz and Barry something. I don't know, I'll put it on the screen. Sorry, sorry, Barry. But they talk about like the tool, basically these are like tools for dealing with anxiety. And one of the tools that they talk about is welcoming pain. You know, when there's something that is making you feel rejected, something you want to avoid doing because you fear the rejection or the consequences that are going to come from it. And they say that you should use the affirmation, I welcome pain and like bring it to you. And like, I get your vibe fellas, but I think I'd phrase it a little differently. I, I think I would phrase it a little differently. I don't feel empowered by saying, I welcome pain. Like that doesn't do it for me. You know what does it for me though? What does it for me is saying, screw you, I can do this. <laughs> that is so much more empowering to me than welcoming the pain. So when I am nervous to do something because of the potential of rejection, I actually didn't even, shout out to me, I didn't even get anxious before I made this call to customer service yesterday. I didn't give myself time to. I just went and did it and then the anxiety hit while I was on the call because of the rejection. But um, you know, usually when I'm psyching myself up to do something that makes me anxious, like walk into a Subway sandwiches and ask if they have the foot long cookie, I just tell myself, screw you, I can do this. Screw the mean voices in my head that tell me this will be so embarrassing and the rejection will be so humiliating that you'll never wanna walk into a Subway sandwiches again. It didn't happen. You know what? They didn't even have the foot long cookie. That day I went in and checked and the lady was really nice about it and she just said no we don't have any more and I said okay thank you so much and I left and it was fine that's a very mild example of course but I do find that a little embarrassment exposure therapy on your own terms ha is good at least it's been helpful for me you know forcing myself to do things like walk into the subway and ask if they have a dollar foot long cookie I did really want the dollar foot long cookie but like I I was like I don't actually need this like oh I don't think they're gonna have it anyways and I just went in and did it by myself I've mentioned on this podcast many times before I used to never want to go shopping by myself because the idea of the employees coming up and talking to me and having to make small talk is just like so intimidating and makes me just feel so preemptively embarrassed like <laughs> before even going in that I avoided it for a long time and now I've just been doing it and sometimes I even challenge myself to like go ask a question to somebody in the store. It's not even that I'm challenging myself but if the desire to do something comes up I try to just go for it before thinking about it too much. And that's also the advice that Phil Stutz and Barry give in their book, The Tools. Like they do say, don't give yourself a lot of time to think about it. And I fully agree with that. Like if you are anxious to do something, anxious to put yourself in a certain scenario, just try, if you, the longer you think about it, dude, overthinker to overthinker right now, the longer you overthink about it, the bigger and scarier it's gonna become. I know, I know, because I feel the same way. I'm like, if I just think through every single possibility that can ever happen in every situation, then I'll be prepared. Girl, no, you won't. You won't. You're just, you're just gonna make yourself more anxious for thinking about it. So you're really better off just 
doing it and rolling with the punches as they come. When you're doing embarrassment exposure therapy, it doesn't always go great. I think it's a great way to build confidence when it does go great, but yeah, there will be sometimes like me yesterday so confidently making my phone call to customer service. Talking on the phone is hard, okay? Talking on the phone with strangers is hard. And when I felt the rejection, I got a little flustered. I didn't really know what to say, and I ended up like wrapping up the phone call as quickly as possible, and of course being very polite, but then I got off the phone and I was like, ooh, I'm all amped up, my heart is beating so fast, I feel like I'm gonna cry, I didn't do anything wrong, like going through all these affirmations in my head, and you know, I found something that helps me is to literally, sh literally shake it off, shake your body. I immediately put on Bodyguard by Beyonce because <laughs> I swear there's some sort of chemical reaction that happens in my brain when I hear that song that just makes me wanna dance and it makes me feel so good Good, and I just needed to put like a period on that interaction and then I ended up going back and I just, the whole thing with the prescription situation worked out like I ended up calling another line and it was fine it was totally fine I didn't do anything wrong it seems that customer service agent may have just been having a tough day and maybe misunderstood what I said or something who knows miscommunications happen on the phone all the time but I did live to tell the tale and see another day so Big thumbs up, RSD zero me one. All right, I think that's enough rambling on that. I couldn't tell you if I've been rambling for five minutes or 45 minutes, so that'll be fun for editing me to figure out. Anyway, let's move on to the mental health bop of the week. It's an unexpected one, it's maybe not. Okay, so when I say mental health bops of the week, I mean songs that have impacted my mental health in a way, whether, well, I guess in a positive way, you know, whether it helped me work through an emotion or it just makes me feel really good. And this week is a mental health BOP, all caps B-O-P BOP. It's Girl I've Always Been by Olivia Rodrigo off of Guts Spilled, the deluxe version. This song makes me feel like I'm walking on air. This song makes me feel like I'm walking on sunshine. I love it so much. It's so like, it's like a kind of a little country. It's giving very Taylor Swift debut. I love it. But basically the concept of the song is that she like breaks up with this guy and he's like asking her like, who have you become? I don't even recognize you. And she goes on this whole thing about like, I have captors, I call friends, I got panic rooms inside my head, I get down with crooked men, but I am the girl I've always been. Basically saying like, I may not be perfect. She goes on to say, I might not be a perfect 10. She says, I know I'm not perfect, but I am the girl I've always been at my core. Like this is such a song about yourself and like knowing yourself really well. I talk a lot on this podcast about feeling like I'm still figuring myself out and <laughs> where I stand on all of these different things. You know, I think that's something we all face. I'm in my Saturn return right now. I'm 29. This tends to be the age that people start getting real deep. Or so I've heard from the internet. I know there's all different ages. People get deep, but I feel like I'm at the most like deep part of my self-love and self-confidence and just sense of self journey right now. And this song is really empowering to me to be like, I, at my core, I have always been this way, down to my soul, down to my absolute core. I am a certain way. And that's something that's very empowering. I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that means like, oh, I have excuses to have bad behaviors or anything. I think she's just saying, you can't tell me that you don't recognize me because I know me better than anyone else. And that's really what's empowering to me because sometimes people will say like, oh, that thing you did was, that didn't really make sense to me. But as long as it makes sense to me, as long it makes sense to you if other people are criticizing the way you do things maybe like I don't know the way you dress the way you do your hair the way you do your makeup or anything and if someone's criticizing that and saying that doesn't feel like very you but to you it feels like you girl you are the girl you've always been girl gender neutral you you person listening to this you are the person you've always been and you know what that means down to your core and don't let anybody tell you otherwise so that song's been very empowering for me this week. It's an absolute mental health bop, and I highly recommend you give it a listen. Oh my goodness, we've reached the end of the episode. I hope that today's episode gave you a, a new term you can put on your radar. Again, I'm not like, ugh, I always feel so defensive to be like, ugh, I'm not trying to label anything. Like, I'm not somebody who needs a bunch of labels, but like, who cares? Maybe I am. Maybe I am somebody who needs labels. Maybe my little neurodivergent brain likes to know terms for things and likes to be able to do research on things and find communities of people who also deal with these things and learn coping mechanisms from each other. You guys, embarrassment exposure therapy. Do it little itty bits at a time. Walk into the subway and ask for a foot long cookie. 
That is the mental health piece of advice this week. As long as you don't have any allergies to the ingredients, but go into Subway and get the footlong cookie. It is so delicious. I am not a big Subway cookie fan. Like, I, I don't know. My mom, my mom makes really good homemade cookies, so I'm, you know, spoiled with chocolate chip cookie recipes, but this footlong cookie was on another level. It was almost like a cookie brownie, like a brookie, but oh, it was so moist. It was so freaking moist and it held up in the fridge really well. So yeah, go get yourself a footlong cookie from Subway. Wow. Wow, great episode. If you like the makeup I'm wearing today, I will list all the products down below for you. Check out my Instagram if you want to see more bold makeup content. And I thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next week with another new episode. Bye, take care of yourself.